The, the question I put from the chair is the motion be agreed to, and this is pretty unusual, but I'll give the call to myself. Um, <laughs> members, um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to say a few words this afternoon of farewell um, as the curtain comes down on nearly 30 years representing the South West region and serving in the Legislative Council. I've grappled with how to reflect 30 years in 40 minutes and make it meaningful and coherent, so I hope I can. When I was first elected in 1987, at the last by-election for the Legislative Council before the introduction of the current proportional representation model, I had no idea my time here would be so long or so challenging, satisfying or rewarding. The two important speeches most members make in this place in terms of defining who we are and what we stand for are our inaugural and valedictory speeches. So I've referred back to my first speech in 1987 as a starting point for my reflections now. And um, I hope you don't mind, as other members uh, have done, I'll stick closely to my notes to make sure that uh, I get into Hansard what I really mean. In a positive way, no, I missed a bit. <laughs> That's, <laughs> um, that wasn't positive, was it? In a way, I can observe that the more things change, the more they stay, stay the same. As I raised concerns then about centralisation of services, it was telecom at that stage, but still, there's still an issue in regional WA despite some progress. Crime rates, um, particularly those relating to drugs, and it's still an issue. In a positive way, I extolled the great virtue of diversity in the southwest and the need for sensitive, sensible development. There was a focus on tourism then, as now, and the great potential of our region. I'm very pleased to see such positive progress in infrastructure requirements I mentioned then such as a South West Airport, the Bustleton Jetty Repair and Upgrade, Margaret River Hospital, Bunbury Entertainment Centre and waterfront developments. Other issues raised were education and health opportunities for young people and the ability of Homes West tenants to become owners of their own homes and dealing with pesticide residue on prime agricultural land. As I reflect on these issues today, it's encouraging that we've come, a, come such a long way but there's still so much more to do, and there's still so much more potential for the future. In terms of the South West electorate, there has been massive changes, mostly for the better, over those 30 years. I like to think this had a lot to do with the theme I mentioned back in 1987, that it is the effectiveness of ownership at a personal and community level in the challenges and opportunities we all face. Much more is gained by taking responsibility for an issue ourselves, individually and collectively, and, and working with government at all levels to achieve a better outcome. It's never productive to sit back and expect the government to do everything. Or worse still, remain constantly at loggerheads with each other to give government the perfect excuse to do nothing. I'm pleased to say there are many examples of self-help communities in the South West which has enlisted the help of government in a constructive way to get things done. Just mentioning a few examples. Firstly, the Friends of the Cape to Cape Track, which I've been fortunate enough to be patron of for 20 odd years. This was initiated by a local group of people who have worked in strong partnership with local governments, Depor, the Margaret River Bustle and Tourist Association, Lottery West, the business community, environment and transport groups to create a now iconic walk trail and tourist attraction known worldwide. This gave me great satisfaction as it was developed on the model of the trails task force I chaired in the 1990s, which recommended to government uh, that um, model and continues to thrive today. Second example, although not a sexy topic, the successful use of treated wastewater throughout Margaret River on ovals, public open space and the golf course only came about through a cooperative approach from the Augusta Margaret River Shire, local schools, the Margaret River Golf Club and eventually, after a bit of persuasion, the Water Corporation. 
A similar proposal, plus other aspects, has been put to government by Bustleton Water, for the Dunsborough area particularly, and was approved by the Barnett Cabinet. This is a win-win situation for government and the community, and I urge the new government to act and implement this as soon as possible. The rejuvenation of the Bustleton Jetty from the smashed wreck it was when I was first elected in 1987 is a great story. Through enormous local community passion, effort, commitment and hard work and subsequent support from government, this is now the prime tourist focus and attraction for Bustleton in particular and that region. In fact, a new tourist train is being unveiled tomorrow, which I hope to attend as one of my last official duties as a local member. Port Geograph, initially unfolded in the 90s and 2000s as an environmental disaster, but through persistence, advocacy, cooperation and again government support, the rock groins were realigned successfully and the area is now back on track to realising its vast potential. Another example close to my heart is the formation of the Margaret River Bustle and Tourist Association from two previously individualised, under-resourced competitors. The Margaret River Bustle and Tourist Association is now a shining beacon in the Australian tourist industry as the most successful and dynamic not-for-profit tourism promotions, marketing and facility operating business in Australia. I have derived an immense amount of satisfaction, sometimes after long periods of frustrating challenges though, by playing some part in all of these projects and more. When I was preparing what I was going to say on these things, I realised that there's perhaps one skill I may have developed a little bit of expertise in, in my role over the last 30 years. That's maybe herding cats. Judging by the many suggestions I've already received lately to take on coordination roles of this type, it looks as if the word has got around and I hope I can keep up a decent success rate before I run out of luck. While on the electorate, I guess I have always operated more like a Legislative Assembly member than a Legislative Council member. Originally from my electorate office in Bunbury for 10 years and then 20 years in Margaret River. To some extent, this has created a rod for my own back and given me a full-time job on top of a full-time job, especially while I've been president for the last eight years, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. I've always considered the community I represent, represent as my primary focus as a representative. I've derived a great deal of satisfaction and reward out of the previous examples and working closely with many other organisations to create a better place to live and work. The heroes of these organisations I've been privileged to work closely with as patron, vice patron or in an advocacy role or support in some way include, and I've got a great list here and I'll read some of them. The Friends of the Cape to Cape Walk Track, Dunsborough Country Club, Cinefest Oz, Margaret River Readers and Writers Festival, Duns Dunsborough Art Society, Geograph Bay Yacht Club, Dunsborough Bay Yacht Club, Kumbana Bay Yacht Club. It's funny, when you get into public life, uh, you end up doing all sorts of jobs that you really had no association with before. I'm a patron of uh, yacht clubs, um, art societies and rifle associations. I can't paint to save myself. I can't sail a boat to save myself and I don't think I've ever fired a gun in anger, but that's the way it goes. Um, Pathways Southwest, the Bunbury Rifle Club, Southwest Rifle Association, WA Rifle Association, Bustledon Tennis Club, the 10th Light Horse Memorial Troop, the Margaret River Bowling Club, Southwest Cricket Association, Bustle and Margaret River Cricket Association, the Margaret River Community Resource Centre, uh, Margaret River Bustle and Tourist Association, which I mentioned, the Chambers of Commerce in the area, Bustleton Water, Arts Margaret River, um, Margaret River um, Agricultural Societies, Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, Men's Sheds Organisations, Zonta Clubs, the um, Augusta Margaret River and Bustleton Football Clubs in particular, the Margaret, Ro Margaret River Underwater Hockey Club, and uh, of course, in terms of events tourism, the South West uh, has an enormous range of successful events, including 
the Margaret River Surf Pro, Gourmet Escape, the Lewin Concert, um, triathlons, Jazz by the Bay, and then the other organisations throughout the community, such as local governments and schools, of course, in the education area and um, health facilities. I know I'm a bit biased, but I've taken to welcoming anyone to an event I have a speaking gig at in the southwest uh, to the to the welcome welcome to the best corner of the best state of the best country in the world. I was humbled when the Augusta Margaret River Shire President Ian Earl, who's here today, um, presented me last Friday night with a mounted plaque for my new home office with those words on it at a farewell reception they hosted for me. Um, I think I'll make it the title of my book if I ever get around to writing it. In terms of the parliament, I've also seen many changes and highs and lows. In 30 years, I've seen four changes of government and experienced slightly more time, 16 and a half years in, in two stints in government under the Court and Barnett governments, than in opposition in three stints um, the last one, thankfully, very brief. <laughs> I've seen many changes in this chamber particularly and around parliament in general. There are many more women now than when I started. There was only three in the 34-member Legislative Council in 1987. This Legislative Council at the time, uh, no, it, sorry, it then changed so that this legislation Legislative Council between 2010 and 2013 led the way in Australasia uh, in the fact that we had 17 out of 36 female members. That's about 47 per cent, um, which at the time was the highest percentage in any Commonwealth parliamentary jurisdiction, jurisdiction apart from Rwanda. As mentioned by previous speakers, it's changed a little bit. Customs and practice have changed. In 1987, smoking was permitted throughout this building, and I have vivid memories of our whip at the time, Margaret McAleer, who was the first female whip in the Parliament of Western Australia, sitting in these chairs at the back of the chamber, smoking strong, pungent capstan cigarettes. And if you look, if you look closely behind me, you can still see several marks where cigarettes have been left to burn out on the woodwork um, next to where the time capsule's in, encased. One of my first actions as president in 2009 was to agree with the speaker to ban smoking in this building. And I think most would agree with us. There was a couple at the time who didn't, and I have no doubt it was the right decision. The lighting in this chamber was terrible and the sag in the roof used to alarm me. <laughs> there was no air conditioning until about 10 years ago, and we had the original bench seating until the long overdue refurbishment early in my term as president in 2009. Now we also have the kangaroo paw um, floral emblem in the carpet, rather than the fleur de lis, as a uniquely appropriate Western Australian theme. In terms of communications, there's been a revolution in the last 30 years. During my by-election campaign in 1987, I was very impressed by Barry McKinnon and Philip Pendle coming to Bunbury using a car phone the size of a brick and a newfangled fax machine, which printed on heat paper, which you had to be careful not to leave in the strong light for more than five minutes or your content would disappear. Now, of course, the world revolves around small handheld phones, emails and social media. This has also affected the way Parliament operates too. <clears throat> Parliament always used to be the place where the executive, the Premier and the Cabinet uh, and his Cabinet Ministers first reported to the people through the parliament via statements, legislation and uh, tabling documents. Now the parliament is often the last place to know, as communication by the government is usually done well in advance of, of parliament being formally informed via media release, which has now even been superseded by Twitter and Facebook and other forms of social media, and even that 
um, uh, working around the mainstream media. Some might interpret this as bypassing parliament and question our relevance, but I see it differently. In my view, this makes parliament even more important as the institution with the powers and obligation to properly and thoroughly scrutinise this information and enforce its accountability role uh, through time-honoured mechanisms such as questions, debates and committee inquiries. So, in this context, I still strongly subscribe to the saying that our system is the worst in the world apart from all the others. And looking towards the future, if and when Australia ever moves to a republic, I plead with Australians to resist the temptation of a directly elected president, United States style, and, and uh, to stay with the Westminster system where the executive is born out of the elected parliament and directly responsible to the people back through that parliament. <clears throat> One of the great pleasures and privileges of being president for the last eight years has been the protocol ambassadorial role as the, as the head of the WA legislature with the speaker. In this role, I've had a close affiliation with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and served on their executive committee for three years. Attended and presented papers at numerous seminars and conferences around Australia, our close friends in the Pacific and the world. This role has also provided me the privilege of representing the WA Parliament to numerous ambassadors and consuls and delegations and leading parliamentary delegations myself to other jurisdictions in China, India, Sri Lanka, Japan, Western Canada, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam and South Africa. And being involved, for instance, in signing documents with two, with two different WA Premiers uh, and the Hyogo Prefecture Governor Ido and their Speaker from Japan to acknowledge the 30th and 35th anniversaries of the WA Hyogo Prefecture Sister State Agreement, the oldest and one of the most meaningful international relationships we have. But the role of President brings other administrative issues as well as the obvious Chamber roles. I want to make some observations about the disjointed and often confusing way the Parliament and Members of Parliament are resourced and serviced. Um, these comments may not be populist, but I consider them to be important. Administrative, arra administrative arrangements are shared in a mishmash way by the Parliament itself, the Executive Government through the Department of Premier and Cabinet, uh, and the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal. The principle is very clear. Members of Parliament should be serviced and administered by Parliament, not the Executive. But of course we can't do this if we're not resourced. While it's difficult to pinpoint any particular instances, there is always the perception that there may be political oversight, interference or bias in resourcing electorate officers and staff, for instance. While the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal in WA was set up well in the 1970s and largely operated independently and at arm's length to determine members' salaries, conditions and entitlements, along with others, I fear it's lost its way since 2000. Our mother parliament, Westminster, saw many of its members and their system discredited a decade or so ago because they had held down members' salaries too low for too long and made the mistake of topping up their incomes with a range of other offline, cash through claims, backdoor, semi-secret benefits, which were in many cases unrelated to their roles as MPs, unaccountable and, and in some cases perhaps bordered on corruption. While they've taken steps to correct their system, I fear we've drifted the other way. Because of member superannuation changes in 2000, the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal have attempted to correct the supposed imbalance between remuneration for members on different superannuation schemes by loading up a range of other benefits, including the extra money paid for serving on a parliamentary committee. I've always figured this should be a core responsibility of being a member of parliament anyhow. 
cash resettlement allowances, where members um, lose 50 per cent of that in tax rather than normal, about 30 per cent, um, to the ATO, as if Western Australians need to send more money to Canberra, uh, given our GST treatment. A cash car allowance to members, $25,000 for Metro members and $42,000 for country members. This was changed unilaterally from the fully serviced vehicle to this system without any consultation and precious little research. I can predict a few things out of this. Country MPs will be much worse off than their Metro colleagues, although on the surface you see 42,000 as opposed to 25. Won't work out that way. The temptation may well be to get inappropriate, even dangerous vehicles and, and uh, resist covering the huge hours and kilometres required to do your job properly. And I know in my case, I've averaged doing between 180 and 100,000 kilometres per annum for 30 years. In the city, some will get perhaps old bombs or cheap smart cars. And the result will be that some members will pocket the balance of money with no accountability. And um, I can also predict that the Parliament House car park will, use, will look like a used car lot, um, full of cars of all sorts of varieties covered in tacky political advertising. That won't do very much for the professional image of parliamentarians. Added to this, they've, uh, a determination provides a cash allowance for parliamentary travel scheme. Now, I'm the first to support the system of funding being made available for members to travel. It's a very important part of a member's professional development as a member of parliament and a representative. But I fear there will be a tendency to not use it at all and perhaps pocket the money and miss out on that professional development or use on some other dubious, um, personal, or other, um, other reason unrelated to their parliamentary duties, where there's no obligation to account to parliament, like in the previous scheme, with a tabled report. In recent years, the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal undertook a work value case for members of parliament and reported after several years' investigation that members of parliament's salaries were trending badly behind judges, senior public servants, tribunal members, local government CEOs, for instance. But they did nothing about it in terms of either restricting the other salaries, if they were so far out of whack, or raising MPs' salaries to bridge that widening gap. Their solution was to resort to these other cash and backdoor benefits for administrative convenience uh, to tap up members' remuneration, but in the process have forgotten about the other responsibilities they've had. For instance, making sure that taxpayers' money is spent accountably and upholding the professional and reputational image of members of parliament, which I believe was one of the main purposes of setting up an independent arm's length salaries and allowances tribunal in the first place. Consequently, MPs' salaries and allowances, conditions and benefits have become uh, playthings for commentators and many in the community who are quick to take easy, easy cheap shots. And if the parliament is solely about, uh, and the parliament be, has becomes for some solely about uh, personality politics and it's treated like a reality TV show. I believe the Salaries and Allowances tri Tribunal has to get back to an open, honest assessment of an MP's worth and allocate salaries and benefits in a fair, fully accountable way to avoid all this innuendo and unfair, unreasonable attention and ridicule. In addition to these developments, I have, an, I have even more concern about a recent suggestion that the executive will set MPs' remuneration by legislation. 
This will take us back decades and attract even more discontent and criticism. We had a good model in the way SAT was set up to operate early, but they've lost their way and need to get back on track as soon as possible. There are other aspects of the management, administration and resourcing of Parliament which needs attention and commitment as well. Sorry, I'm sweating a bit. <laughs> the, the Parliament is the state's primary institution and should be taken more seriously. This Parliament was first built on this side in 1904 representing great foresight by our forefathers. There are many sketches and plans around this building indicating what it was supposed to look like when it was finished. But it was only half built then, containing the two chambers, dining room and the library, which originally was intended as a ballroom, and little else. The only major addition since, since then, in 1964, has been the eastern three-storey extension containing the entrance, staircase and office space and turning the building around to face down St George's Terrace as was always intended. But in the 1960s, the freeway was also carved out, creating the great division between Parliament and the Perth CBD which still exists. Apart from a few other relatively minor changes, there's been no major expenditure to help this institution cope with the exponential growth in complexity and demand on our functions and services in the 113 years since it was first built. Parliament House is a wonderful old building, but now totally inadequate for modern requirements. We lease expensive space in five other buildings scattered around West Perth to, ex to accommodate parliamentary committees, library, administration, IT services and other functions. The Parliament has received a million dollars annually for the last decade for maintenance and some minor capital improvements. As you can imagine, this doesn't go far on a 113-year-old heritage building and barely scratches the surface of an estimated $30 million backlog required for proper maintenance alone. Through excellent and prudent management by the parliamentary departments, They've done well to maintain standards in this institution and made some improvements, but these are only band-aid solutions. For example, the courtyard, where we've used old pavers and all-weather covers when the building really requires a sensible glass dome across the whole area. A second example, reworking every bit of space possible downstairs for Hansard and building services staff to free up a few more badly needed offices for members. And thirdly, uh, we're currently working on a proposal to refurbish the old fountain structures at the front of Parliament House for barely adequate office accommodation to locate some staff and save on expensive lease costs across the road. It's been frustrating and I um, take note of the previous remarks. It's been very frustrating dealing with this situation over the years. This reached extreme levels for me and the Speaker about a couple of years ago when the public servants in the government accommodation area failed to secure the property at Three Harvest Terrace, which is wedged between other government-owned properties at One Five and Seven Harvest Terrace when it came up for tender. This would have given the government ownership of a sizeable development opportunity of four adjoining lots at a very reasonable cost, allowing for development of their own building or selling it as a development lot and transferring the money to the parliamentary precinct. Instead, ineptitude over this opportunity soured this, uh, this and it was lost. And pretty soon we had the new private owner on our doorstep with a concept plan to develop the property to our specifications and enter into a long-term lease, of course. While I understand his, uh, his motives, and it was the best option I'd seen in my eight years as president, our preferred option has always been for the government 
to build our own dedicated ancillary building on the current car park site to provide committee areas, function space, secure parking, um, which is more than ever required in the modern age, and other, sat and other staffing areas so all services can be located on the parliamentary precinct. A comprehensive plan to address this situation was done in 2010. As presiding officers uh, at the time, we persuaded the Premier, the Honourable Colin Barnett, to fund a master plan for about $100,000 for this area of West Perth. It was logical in other ways as well, because Perth had largely been linked to the north by the sinking of the railway line and Yagan Square opened up to the south and the river by Elizabeth Quay, and linked to the east by apartment buildings, the new stadium and the Burswood complexes. That left the untouched divide to the west created by the freeway. Parliament is the people's house and we need to improve the connect connectivity physically and, and symbolically between the parliament and the people in the Perth CBD. The master plan of 2010 addressed these issues in an excellent way by proposing a cover area over the freeway between the Hay Street and Malcolm Street bridges, creating a large people space and also providing some commercial opportunities to help fund the venture, and outlined staged plans for ancillary buildings on the parliamentary precinct and the executive precinct around Dumas House and the Old Hale School. Also outlined was the need for parliamentary precinct legislation. We are one of the very few jurisdictions not to have this in place, despite strong advocacy by a succession of presiding officers to governments of both persuasions over many years. Regrettably, apart from some adjustments to the executive precinct, as the government had to relocate ministers' offices out of 197 St George's Terrace when the building was refurbished, the master plan was not acted on or released to the public. While the master plan will obviously need the figures reworked, it is a very sound document containing an excellent plan to move forward. Therefore, to stimulate discussion and hopefully action, I now table the Parliamentary Precinct Master Plan Report Document A, Findings and Recommendations Final Draft. <laughs> which I was privy to in 2010 as a participant in the working party set up under the government architect. I hope this provides everyone with enough information to pursue an important and worthy cause. Yes, it will cost money, and we all realise the financial climate is not good at the moment, but I urge the 40th parliament to engage in a sensible, mature and bipartisan debate on this matter to make at least a commitment to address the need in a staged way over the next decade. So I wish you luck in that and I hope to, I live to see it. Just about as nervous as I was in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for me to look uh, towards the future. I'm going to attempt to do this by changing the terminology from retirement to rewirement. <laughs> Community involvement is now well and truly in my blood and makeup, so I intend to remain active in some aspects, but I intend to step back from a lot of things initially and work out which areas I can and want to stay involved in. I've developed a keen interest in the tourism area, so this may well be an avenue in the years ahead. I also want to retain a bit of time for myself, so I hope I can pursue my love of sport with an occasional game of golf, tennis, or maybe bowls, and I've warmed up for that with the last couple of parliamentary bowls carnivals. I have a nice rural property at Yelling Up, which needs a bit of tidying up. So I'll get a decent tractor to play with as a big toy for a while before deciding what to do to realise its potential in the longer term. 
But I suspect it's a pretty stupid idea to even contemplate starting farming at the age of 67. We'll see. <laughs> You're only young. I've set up my man cave at home with a decent shed and office to operate from. I'm a hoarder, so I've mountains of accumulated boxes, papers, photos, artwork and bits and pieces from 30 years of electorate office and parliamentary work. Um, so that has to be sorted through first. I have intentions of writing my memoirs for my three grandchildren, if no one else. And this may evolve into some more detail about my family history and the South West. I hope to have more time to spend with my family, although my daughter lives in Melbourne and son with his young family in Sydney, so maybe a bit of travel might be involved as well. I know this will be an adjustment required in, there will be an adjustment required in lifestyle. I've been a bit of a nomad for 30 years in a sense, living a half a dozen different lives, constantly in a motor car, and almost permanently living out of a suitcase. So that's the lot of a regional member of parliament in Western Australia. Finally, and I'm a bit glad to hear that, some acknowledgements and thank yous. It's been an enormous privilege to be a parliamentary representative in this Legislative Council for the last 30 years. And I'm honoured and humbled that I've had this chance in life that I'd do it all again. None of us do it on our own, so I want to identify some key people without trying to name everyone. I'd like to, but I would be here for a couple of hours, which I don't think you want to particularly miss afternoon tea and dinner. Um, but please be assured I include all when I mention uh, a department, organisation or area you've been involved in. To all my colleagues and friends, past and present, in the Legislative Council and the wider Parliament. And I count members and staff in that general description. Uh, can I recognise a few? And in terms of the uh, current Legislative Council, the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Collier, and the now Leader of the House, uh, the Honourable Sue Ellery, who's away on ministerial business today, but she left a very nice note for me today which I appreciate, uh, and everybody connected with all sides of this parliament. It's been a, an enormous privilege to know you. It's been an enormous privilege to know and work with all of your predecessors and, um, and some of your successors as well. In terms of the staffing of parliament, the departments of this parliament, headed by the clerk of the Legislative Council, Nigel Pratt, Rob Hunter, the Executive Manager of PSD, and Kirsten Robinson, the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly, are outstanding, professional and capable people. And they provide great leadership to this parliament. The cooperation and cohesion between the different parliamentary departments and with other important institutions such as Government House and the Governor have never been better. So I congratulate and thank. Uh, my clerk and all the other executives in this building. And by definition, everybody else under those departments who has provided such wonderful support and friendship over 30 years. It is really appreciated. My personal staff as president, firstly, Lorraine Coogan, my PA, who's sitting up the back. Um, Lorraine provides the style and class and is more than anyone responsible for the high standards that are maintained around this parliament. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, you've also served three previous presidents um, extremely well as well. You'll be retiring yourself in about a month, so um, I wish you all the very best for the future. To um, Deborah, Deborah Kapoor, who's also up the back. Deborah is ever cheerful and efficient um, as the president steward. Uh, she's helped me enormously over the years, as she has done to all other Legislative Council members. 
There's many others in terms of staffing of the Parliament House, but I want to isolate one, and that one person is Simona Millia. Simona, as many of you know, is, is a librarian in this, uh, in this institution. She has enormous passion and commitment to this institution as a parliament, and she has enormous artistic ability, which is uh, uh, extraordinary. I've been very privileged uh, that Simona has done five paintings for me over recent years, which I've purchased from her, of the parliament, and I've used those for my Christmas cards over the years, and they've created uh, a terrific series. Um, and there was a, an exhibition for Simona last year, you might recall. They make a wonderful collection. I'm not sure I have the appropriate place for them at the moment, but I intend to talk to the Clerk of the Legislative Council and the uh, Parliamentary Art Advisory Committee about leaving them here for display on loan, um, if that's considered appropriate. And last week, I might add that Simona uh, presented me with a, with a portrait, which uh, blew me away. She is a very uh, kind-hearted and uh, wonderful lady. Thank you, Simona. In terms of the community, obviously the Liberal Party in general, um, none of us or very few of us ever get to this institution without the backing of a political party. And the Liberal Party have uh, backed me over many years, um, sometimes a bit more positively than others, but, uh, <laughs> but we all scrape through. Um, I've already named a heap of organisations earlier and have many friends in all of them. I'm proud to... Um, I'm proud of all of them and admire their passion, commitment and their achievements for their communities. And by being associated with them in some way, I've also derived huge satisfaction and rewards out of working with every one of them. And they, more than anybody else, have made the South West that title that I've given it, the best corner of the best state of the best country in the world. In terms of my electorate office's office, which is uh, the front for us to the community, I've been very fortunate to have several, to have had several long-term electorate officers who have served me uh, extremely well and have become great friends as well. Um, particularly, can I name a couple? Firstly, Libby Medham. Um, is Libby here? Uh, I think she was going to try and get here, but uh, Libby, as you know now, is the member for VAS, and uh, she's a person who has developed enormously um, in capacity over recent years, and I'm very proud of her. Sylvia Griffin was my first electorate officer and stayed with me for 18 years. Hartley Joint, a great friend, and current, my current electorate officers are Robin McBeath and Erin Davey, who have been fantastic support. And over the other time, I've had uh, um, some other electorate officers who have worked for short periods in my office, including Fran Temby at the back, who's helped out from time to time. Thank you, Fran. To my family and friends in general, as many mention in their valedictory speeches, this is the area we all know affects us and them, and um, they're affected the most uh, in this unique and often crazy world that we operate in. So, uh, my immediate family, um, can I uh, hugely thank Sharon, Bridget, Michael, Emily, and my three grandies, Eva, Quinn, and Wren. So, there you go, their names are in Hansard. And uh, I want to publicly thank them and acknowledge their great support. I've also got other family here uh, this afternoon too. I have my brother, Ray, uh, cousin Graham, and some other friends from Margaret River and elsewhere. I really appreciate you taking the um, uh, time to be here. Uh, past colleagues, the Honourable Matt Benson, my deputy for four years, and uh, the Honourable Ray Halligan. Um, were great support. 
And uh, without naming anybody else in particular, because I'll forget somebody, I generally want to thank everybody involved in this uh, institution. So finally, um, again, we're very lucky to operate under this, uh, this system of government. My message to all members and staff remaining and the community we represent is to continue to work hard, respect the institution, and it will continue to serve us well into the future. And in conclusion, I'll return to my inaugural speech from 1987 when I concluded then with these two sentences. I would like to mention how humble and honoured I feel at being here to make this speech today. I'm looking forward to serving this House and the State for some time to come and aim to earn that honour by being a diligent and effective member. I still feel the same today in terms of that first sentence after 30 years. And in terms of the second part, all we can really hope for is respect and credibility for the way we've operated, worked with people and achieved good outcomes. I hope I've I have some of that respect and credibility as the curtain falls on this stage of my life and I enter the next. So thank you and best wishes to the Legislative Council, the Parliament in general and the South West community I've been so pleased and privileged to work with. Thank you.